Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Horror Babble. Today, Artifacts of Horror draws to a close. The final episode being Out of the Eons, by H.P. Lovecraft and Hazel Heald. We do hope you've enjoyed this series. And without further ado... Out of the Eons, by H.P. Lovecraft and Hazel Heald. 1. Manuscript found among the effects of the late Richard H. Johnson, Ph.D., curator of the Cabot Museum of Archaeology, Boston, Massachusetts. It is not likely that anyone in Boston, or any alert reader elsewhere, will ever forget the strange affair of the Cabot Museum. The newspaper publicity given to that hellish mummy, the antique and terrible rumours vaguely linked with it, the morbid wave of interest and cult activities during 1932, and the frightful fate of the two intruders on December 1st of that year, all combined to form one of those classic mysteries, which go down for generations as folklore, and become the nuclei of whole cycles of horrific speculation. Everyone seems to realise, too, that something very vital and unutterably hideous was suppressed in the public accounts of the culminant Horace. Those first disquieting hints as to the condition of one of the two bodies were dismissed and ignored too abruptly, nor were the singular modifications in the mummy given the following up which their news value would normally prompt. It also struck people as queer that the mummy was never restored to its case, in these days of expert taxidermy, the excuse that its disintegrating condition made exhibition impracticable seemed a peculiarly lame one. As curator of the museum, I am in a position to reveal all the suppressed facts, but this I shall not do during my lifetime. There are things about the world and universe which it is better for the majority not to know, and I have not departed from the opinion in which all of us, museum staff, physicians, reporters, and police, concurred at the period of the horror itself. At the same time, it seems proper that a matter of such overwhelming scientific and historic importance should not remain wholly unrecorded. Hence this account, which I have prepared for the benefit of serious students. I shall place it among various papers to be examined after my death, leaving its fate to the discretion of my executors. Certain threats and unusual events during the past weeks have led me to believe that my life— as well as that of other museum officials, is in some peril, through the enmity of several widespread secret cults of Asiatics, Polynesians, and heterogeneous mystical devotees, hence it is possible that the work of the executors may not be long postponed. Executors note, Dr. Johnson died suddenly and rather mysteriously of heart failure on April 22, 1933. Wentworth Moore, taxidermist of the museum, disappeared around the middle of the preceding month. On February 18th of the same year, Dr. William Minot, who superintended a dissection connected with the case, was stabbed in the back, dying the following day. The real beginning of the horror, I suppose, was in 1879, long before my term as curator, when the museum acquired that ghastly, inexplicable mummy from the Orient Shipping Company. Its very discovery was monstrous and menacing, for it came from a crypt of unknown origin and fabulous antiquity, on a bit of land suddenly upheaved from the Pacific's floor. On May 11th, 1878, Captain Charles Weatherby, of the freighter Aridness, bound from Wellington, New Zealand, to Valparaiso, Chile, had sighted a new island unmarked on any chart, and evidently of volcanic origin. It projected quite boldly out of the sea in the form of a truncated cone. A landing party under Captain Weatherby noted evidences of long submersion on the rugged slopes which they climbed, while at the summit there were signs of recent destruction, as by an earthquake. Among the scattered rubble were massive stones of manifestly artificial shaping, and a little examination disclosed the presence of some of that prehistoric cyclopean masonry found on certain Pacific islands, and forming a perpetual archaeological puzzle. Finally, 
the sailors entered a massive stone crypt, judged to have been part of a much larger edifice, and to have originally lain far underground, in one corner of which the frightful mummy crouched. After a short period of virtual panic, caused partly by certain carvings on the walls, the men were induced to move the mummy to the ship, though it was only with fear and loathing that they touched it. Close to the body, as if once thrust into its clothes, was a cylinder of an unknown metal, containing a roll of thin, bluish-white membrane of equally unknown nature, inscribed with peculiar characters in a greyish, indeterminable pigment. In the centre of the vast stone floor was a suggestion of a trap-door, but the party lacked apparatus sufficiently powerful to move it. The Cabot Museum, then newly established, saw the meagre reports of the discovery, and at once took steps to acquire the mummy and the cylinder. Curator Pickman made a personal trip to Valparaiso, and outfitted a schooner to search for the crypt where the thing had been found, though meeting with failure in this matter. At the recorded position of the island, nothing but the sea's unbroken expanse could be discerned, and the seekers realized that the same seismic forces which had suddenly thrust the island up had carried it down again to the watery darkness where it had brooded for untold eons. The secret of that immovable trapdoor would never be solved. The mummy in the cylinder, however, remained, and the former was placed on exhibition early in November, 1879, in the Museum's Hall of Mummies. The Cabot Museum of Archaeology, which specializes in such remnants of ancient and unknown civilizations as do not fall within the domain of art, is a small and scarcely famous institution, though one of high standing in scientific circles. It stands in the heart of Boston's exclusive Beacon Hill district, in Mount Vernon Street, near Joy, housed in a former private mansion, with an added wing in the rear, and was a source of pride to its austere neighbours, until the recent terrible events brought it an undesirable notoriety. The Hall of Mummies, on the western side of the original mansion, which was designed by Bullfinch and directed in 1819, on the second floor, is justly esteemed by historians and anthropologists as harbouring the greatest collection of its kind in America. Here may be found typical examples of Egyptian embalming, from the earliest Saqqara specimens to the last Coptic attempts of the eighth century. Mummies of other cultures, including the prehistoric Indian specimens recently found in the Aleutian Islands, agonized Pompeian figures moulded in plaster from tragic hollows in the ruin-choking ashes naturally mummified bodies from mines and other excavations in all parts of the earth, some surprised by their terrible entombment in the grotesque postures caused by their last tearing death throes, everything, in short, which any collection of the sort could well be expected to contain. In 1879, of course, it was much less ample than it is now, yet even then it was remarkable. But— that shocking thing from the primal Cyclopean crypt on an ephemeral sea-spawned island was always its chief attraction, and most impenetrable mystery. The mummy was that of a medium-sized man of unknown race, and was cast in a peculiar crouching posture. The face, half shielded by claw-like hands, had its underjaw thrust far forward, while the shriveled features bore an expression of fright so hideous that few spectators could view them unmoved. The eyes were closed, with lids clamped down tightly over eyeballs apparently bulging and prominent. Bits of hair and beard remained, and the colour of the whole was a sort of dull, neutral grey. In texture, the thing was half leathery and half stony, forming an insoluble enigma to those experts who sought to ascertain how it was embalmed. In places, Bits of its substance were eaten away by time and decay, rags of some peculiar fabric with suggestions of unknown designs, still clung to the object. Just what made it so infinitely horrible and repulsive one could hardly say. For one thing, there was a subtle, indefinable sense of limitless antiquity and utter alienage which affected one like a view from the brink of a monstrous abyss of unplumbed blackness, but mostly it was the expression of crazed fear on the puckered, prognathous, half-shielded face. 
Such a symbol of infinite, inhuman cosmic fright could not help communicating the emotion to the beholder, amidst a disquieting cloud of mystery and vain conjecture. Among the discriminating few who frequented the Cabot Museum, this relic of an elder forgotten world soon acquired an unholy fame, though the institution's seclusion and quiet policy prevented it from becoming a popular sensation of the Cardiff giant sort. In the last century, the art of vulgar ballyhoo had not invaded the field of scholarship to the extent it has now succeeded in doing. Naturally, savants of various kinds tried their best to classify the frightful object, though always without success. Theories of a bygone Pacific civilization, of which the Easter Island images and the megalithic masonry of Ponape and Nanmatola conceivable vestiges, were freely circulated among students and learned journals carried varied and often conflicting speculations on a possible former continent, whose peaks survive as the myriad islands of Melanesia and Polynesia. The diversity in dates assigned to the hypothetical vanished culture or continent was at once bewildering and amusing, yet some surprisingly relevant allusions were found in certain myths of Tahiti and other islands. Meanwhile, the strange cylinder and its baffling scroll of unknown hieroglyphs, carefully preserved in the museum library, received their due share of attention. No question could exist as to their association with the mummy. Hence all realized that in the unraveling of their mystery, the mystery of the shriveled horror would in all probability be unraveled as well. The cylinder, about four inches long by seven-eighths of an inch in diameter, was of a queerly iridescent metal utterly defying chemical analysis, and seemingly impervious to all reagents. It was tightly fitted with a cap of the same substance, and bore engraved figurings of an evidently decorative and possibly symbolic nature, conventional designs which seemed to follow a peculiarly alien, paradoxical, and doubtfully describable system of geometry. Not less mysterious was the scroll it contained— a neat roll of some thin, bluish-white, unanalyzable membrane, coined round a slim rod of metal like that of the cylinder, and unwinding to a length of some two feet, the large, bold hieroglyphs extending in a narrow line down the centre of the scroll, and penned or painted with a grey pigment, defying analysis, resembled nothing known to linguists and paleographers, and could not be deciphered despite the transmission of photographic copies to every living expert in the given field. It is true that a few scholars, unusually versed in the literature of occultism and magic, found vague resemblances between some of the hieroglyphs and certain primal symbols, described or cited in two or three very ancient, obscure, and esoteric texts, such as the Book of Ibon, reputed to descend from forgotten Hyperborea, the narcotic fragments alleged to be pre-human, and the monstrous and forbidden Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul al-Hazred. None of these resemblances, however, was beyond dispute, and because of the prevailing low estimation of occult studies, no effort was made to circulate copies of the hieroglyphs among mystical specialists. Had such circulation occurred at this early date, the later history of the case might have been very different. Indeed, a glance at the hieroglyphs by any reader of von Jantz's horrible nameless cults would have established a linkage of unmistakable significance. At this period, however, the readers of that monstrous blasphemy were exceedingly few, copies having been incredibly scarce in the interval between the suppression of the original Dusseldorf edition, 1839, and of the Bridewell translation, 1845, and the publication of the expurgated reprint by the Golden Goblin Press, in 1909. Practically speaking, no occultist or student of the primal past's esoteric lore had his attention called to the strange scroll, until the recent outburst of sensational journalism, which precipitated the horrible climax. 2. Thus matters glided along for a half-century, following the installation of the frightful mummy at the museum. The gruesome object had a local celebrity among cultivated Bostonians, but no more than that, while the very existence of the cylinder and scroll, after a decade of futile research, was virtually forgotten. 
So quiet and conservative was the Cabot Museum, that no reporter or feature writer ever thought of invading its uneventful precincts for rabble-tickling material. The invasion of Ballyhoo commenced in the spring of 1931, when a purchase of somewhat spectacular nature, that of the strange objects and inexplicably preserved bodies found in crypts beneath the almost vanished and evilly famous ruins of Chateau Force Flamme in Averroin, France, brought the museum prominently into the news columns. True to its hustling policy, the Boston Pillar sent a Sunday feature writer to cover the incident and pad it with an exaggerated general account of the institution itself, and this young man, Stuart Reynolds by name, hit upon the nameless mummy as a potential sensation, far surpassing the recent acquisitions nominally forming his chief assignment. A smattering of theosophical lore, and a fondness for the speculations of such writers as Colonel Churchwood and Lewis Spence concerning lost continents and primal forgotten civilizations, made Reynolds especially alert toward any Ionian relic, like the unknown mummy. At the museum, the reporter made himself a nuisance through constant and not always intelligent questionings, and endless demands for the movement of encased objects to permit photographs from unusual angles. In the basement library room, he pored endlessly over the strange metal cylinder and its membranous scroll, photographing them from every angle, and securing pictures of every bit of the weird hieroglyph text. He likewise asked to see all books with any bearing whatever on the subject of primal cultures and sunken continents, sitting for three hours taking notes, and leaving only in order to hasten to Cambridge, for a sight, if permission were granted, of the abhorred and forbidden Necronomicon at the Widener Library. On April 5th, the article appeared in the Sunday Pillar, smothered in photographs of mummy, cylinder, and hieroglyphed scroll, and couched in the peculiarly simpering, infantile style, which the Pillar affects for the benefit of its vast and mentally immature clientele. Full of inaccuracies, exaggerations, and sensationalism, it was precisely the sort of thing to stir the brainless and fickle interest of the herd, and as a result the once quiet museum began to be swarmed with chattering and vacuously staring throngs such as its stately corridors had never known before. There were scholarly and intelligent visitors, too, despite the puerility of the article. The pictures had spoken for themselves, and many persons of mature attainments sometimes see the pillar by accident. I recall one very strange character, who appeared during November, a dark, turbaned, and bushily bearded man with a laboured, unnatural voice, curiously expressionless face, clumsy hands covered with absurd white mittens, who gave a squalid West End address, and called himself Swarmy Chandra Putra. This fellow was unbelievably erudite in occult lore, and seemed profoundly and solemnly moved by the resemblance of the hieroglyphs on the scroll to certain signs and symbols of a forgotten elder world about which he professed vast, intuitive knowledge. By June, the fame of the mummy and scroll had leaked far beyond Boston, and the museum had inquiries and requests for photographs from occultists and students of Arcana all over the world. This was not altogether pleasing to our staff, since we're a scientific institution without sympathy for fantastic dreamers, yet we answered all questions with civility. One result of these catechisms was a highly learned article in the Occult Review by the famous New Orleans mystic Etienne Lorraine de Marini, in which was asserted the complete identity of some of the odd geometrical designs on the iridescent cylinder, and of several of the hieroglyphs on the membranous scroll, with certain ideographs of horrible significance, transcribed from primal monoliths, or from the secret rituals of hidden bands of esoteric students and devotees, reproduced in the hellish and suppressed black book or nameless cults of von Janst. De Marini recalled the frightful death of von Janst in 1840, a year after the publication of his terrible volume at Dusseldorf, and commented on his blood-curdling and partly suspected sources of information. Above all, he emphasized the enormous relevance of the tales with which von Janst linked most of the monstrous ideographs he had reproduced. That these tales, in which a cylinder and scroll were expressly mentioned, 
held a remarkable suggestion of relationship to the things at the museum, no one could deny. Yet they were of such breathtaking extravagance, involving such unbelievable sweeps of time, and such fantastic anomalies of a forgotten elder world, that one could much more easily admire than believe them. Admire them the public certainly did, for copying in the press was universal. Illustrated articles sprang up everywhere, telling or purporting to tell the legends in the black book, expatiating on the horror of the mummy, comparing the cylinder's designs and the scroll's hieroglyphs with the figures reproduced by von Junst, and indulging in the wildest, most sensational, and most irrational theories and speculations. Attendance at the museum was trebled, and the widespread nature of the interest was attested by the plethora of mail on the subject, most of it inane and superfluous, received at the museum. Apparently the mummy and its origin formed, for imaginative people, a close rival to the Depression as chief topic of 1931 and 1932. For my own part, the principal effect of the furore was to make me read von Janst's monstrous volume in the Golden Goblin edition, a perusal which left me dizzy and nauseated, yet thankful that I had not seen the utter infamy of the unexpurgated text. 3. The archaic whispers reflected in the black book, and linked with designs and symbols so closely akin to what the mysterious scroll and cylinder bore, were indeed of a character to hold one spellbound, and not a little awestruck leaping an incredible gulf of time. Behind all the civilizations, races, and lands we know, they clustered round a vanished nation and a vanished continent of the misty, fabulous dawn years, that to which legend has given the name of Mu, and which old tablets in the primal Nicol tongue speak of as flourishing two hundred thousand years ago, when Europe harboured only hybrid entities, and lost Hyperborea knew the nameless worship of black amorphous Sathagua. There was mention of a kingdom or province called Kana, in a very ancient land, where the first human people had found monstrous ruins left by those who had dwelt there before, vague waves of unknown entities which had filtered down from the stars, and lived out their eons on a forgotten, nascent world. Kana was a sacred place, since from its midst the bleak basalt cliffs of Mount Yadith go, soared starkly into the sky, topped by a gigantic fortress of Cyclopean stone, infinitely older than mankind, and built by the alien spawn of the dark planet Yugoth, which had colonized the earth before the birth of terrestrial life. The spawn of Yugoth had perished eons before, but had left behind them one monstrous and terrible living thing, which could never die, their hellish god or patron demon, Gatanathoa, which lowered and brooded eternally, though unseen, in the crypts beneath that fortress on Yadith Go. No human creature had ever climbed Yadith Go, or seen that blasphemous fortress, except as a distant and geometrically abnormal outline against the sky. Yet most agreed that Gatanathoa was still there wallowing and burrowing in unsuspected abysses beneath the megalithic walls. There were always those who believed that sacrifices must be made to Gatanathoa, lest it crawl out of its hidden abysses and waddle horribly through the world of men, as it had once waddled through the primal world of the Yugoth spawn. People said that if no victims were offered, Gatanathoa would ooze up to the light of day and lumber down the basalt cliffs of Yadithgo, bringing doom to all it might encounter. For no living thing could behold Gatanathoa, or even a perfect graven image of Gatanathoa, however small, without suffering a change more horrible than death itself. Sight of the god, or its image, as all the legends of the Yugothspawn agreed, meant paralysis and petrifaction of a singularly shocking sort, in which the victim was turned to stone and leather on the outside, while the brain within remained perpetually alive, horribly fixed and prisoned through the ages, and maddeningly conscious of the passage of interminable epochs of helpless inaction, till chance and time might complete the decay of the petrified shell, and leave it exposed to die. 
Most brains, of course, would go mad long before this eon-deferred release could arrive. No human eyes, it was said, had ever glimpsed Gatanathoa, though the danger was as great now as it had been for the Yagoth spawn. And so there was a cult in Kanar which worshipped Gatanathoa, and each year sacrificed to it twelve young warriors and twelve young maidens. These victims were offered up on flaming altars in the marble temple near the mountain's base, for none dared climb Yadith Go's basalt cliffs or draw near to the Cyclopean pre-human stronghold on its crest. Vast was the power of the priests of Gatanathoa, since upon them alone depended the preservation of Kanar and of all the land of Mu from the petrifying emergence of Gatanathoa out of its unknown burrows. There were in the land a hundred priests of the Dark God, under Imash Mo the High Priest, who walked before King Thabon at the Nath Feast, and stood proudly, whilst the king knelt at the Doric Shrine. Each priest had a marble house, a chest of gold, two hundred slaves, and a hundred concubines, besides immunity from civil law, and the power of life and death over all in Kanar, save the priests of the king. Yet in spite of these defenders, there was ever a fear in the land, lest Gatanatho would slither up from the depths and lurch viciously down the mountain, to bring horror and petrifaction to mankind. In the latter years, the priests forbade men even to guess or imagine what its frightful aspect might be. It was in the year of the Red Moon, estimated as B.C. 173,148 by von Janst, that a human being first dared to breathe defiance against Gatanathoa and its nameless menace. This bold heretic was Tyog, high priest of Shabnagurath, and guardian of the copper temple of the goat with a thousand young. Tyog had thought long on the powers of the various gods, and had had strange dreams and revelations touching the life of this and earlier worlds. In the end, he felt sure that the gods friendly to man could be arrayed against the hostile gods, and believed that Shabnagurath, Nag and Yeb, as well as Yig, the serpent god, were ready to take sides with man against the tyranny and presumption of Gatanathoa. Inspired by the mother goddess, Tyog wrote down a strange formula in the hieratic Nakal of his order, which he believed would keep the possessor immune from the dark god's petrifying power. With this protection, he reflected, it might be possible for a bold man to climb the dreaded basalt cliffs and, first of all human beings, enter the Cyclopean fortress beneath which Gatanathoa reputedly brooded. Face to face with the god, and with the power of Shabnagurath and her sons on his side, Tyog believed that he might be able to bring it to terms, and at last deliver mankind from its brooding menace. With humanity freed through his efforts, there would be no limits to the honours he might claim. All the honours of the priests of Gatanathoa would perforce be transferred to him, and even kingship or godhood might conceivably be within his reach. So Tyog wrote his protective formula on a scroll of Thagon membrane, according to von Janst, the inner skin of the extinct Yakith lizard, and enclosed it in a carven cylinder of larg metal, the metal brought by the elder ones from Yugoth, and found in no mine of earth. This charm, carried in his robe, would make him proof against the menace of Gatanathoa. It would even restore the dark god's petrified victims, if that monstrous entity should ever emerge and begin its devastations. Thus he proposed to go up the shunned and man-untrodden mountain, invade the alien-angled citadel of Cyclopean stone, and confront the shocking devil entity in its lair. Of what would follow, he could not even guess, but the hope of being mankind's saviour lent strength to his will. He had, however, reckoned without the jealousy and self-interest of Gatanathoa's pampered priests. No sooner did they hear of his plan than, fearful for their prestige and privilege in case the demon god should be dethroned, they set up a frantic clamour against the so-called sacrilege, crying that no man might prevail against Gatanathoa and that any effort to seek it out would merely provoke it to a hellish onslaught against mankind which no spell or priestcraft could hope to avert. With those cries they hoped to turn the public mind against Tyog, 
Yet such was the people's yearning for freedom from Gatanathoa, and such their confidence in the skill and zeal of Tayog, that all the protestations came to naught. Even the king, usually a puppet of the priests, refused to forbid Tayog's daring pilgrimage. It was then that the priests of Gatanathoa did by stealth what they could not do openly. One night, Imashmo, the high priest, stole to Tayog in his temple chamber, and took from his sleeping form the metal cylinder, silently drawing out the potent scroll and putting in its place another scroll of great similitude, yet varied enough to have no power against any god or demon. When the cylinder was slipped back into the sleeper's cloak, Imashmo was content, for he knew Tayog was little likely to study that cylinder's contents again. Thinking himself protected by the true scroll, the heretic would march up the forbidden mountain, and into the evil presence, and Gatanathoa, unchecked by any magic, would take care of the rest. It would no longer be needful for Gatanathoa's priests to preach against the defiance. Let Tiog go his way and meet his doom. And secretly, the priest would always cherish the stolen scroll, the true and potent charm, handing it down from one high priest to another, for use in any dim future, when it might be needful to contravene the devil-god's will. So, the rest of the night, Imashmo slept in great peace, with the true scroll in a new cylinder, fashioned for its harbourage. It was dawn on the day of the sky flames, nomenclature undefined by von Janst, that to Yog, amidst the prayers and chanting of the people, and with King Thabon's blessing on his head, started up the dreaded mountain with a staff of Talath wood in his right hand. Within his robe was the cylinder, holding what he thought to be the true charm, for he had indeed failed to find out the imposture, nor did he see any irony in the prayers which Imash Mo and the other priests of Gatanathoa intoned for his safety and success. All that morning the people stood and watched as Tayog's dwindling form struggled up the shunned basalt slope hitherto alien to men's footsteps and many stayed watching long after he had vanished, where a perilous ledge led round to the mountain's hidden side. That night, a few sensitive dreamers thought they heard a faint tremor convulsing the hated peak, though most ridiculed them for the statement. Next day, vast crowds watched the mountain and prayed, and wondered how soon to Yog would return. And so the next day, and the next. For weeks they hoped and waited, and then they wept. Nor did anyone ever see to Yog, who would have saved mankind from fears, again. Thereafter, men shuddered at Tiog's presumption, and tried not to think of the punishment his impiety had met. And the priests of Gatanathoa smiled to those who might resent the god's will or challenge its right to the sacrifices. In later years, the ruse of Imashmo became known to the people, yet the knowledge availed not to change the general feeling that Gatanathoa were better left alone. None ever dared to defy it again. And so the ages rolled on, and king succeeded king, and high priest succeeded high priest, and nations rose and decayed, and lands rose above the sea and returned into the sea, and with many millennia decay fell upon Kanar, till at last, on a hideous day of storm and thunder, terrific rumbling and mountain-high waves, all the land of Mu sank into the sea forever. Yet down the later eons thin streams of ancient secrets trickled. In distant lands there met together grey-faced fugitives who had survived the sea fiend's rage, and strange skies drank the smoke of altars reared to vanished gods and demons though none knew to what bottomless deep the sacred peak and cyclopean fortress of dreaded Gatanathoa had sunk, there were still those who mumbled its name and offered to it nameless sacrifices, lest it bubble up through leagues of ocean and shamble among men, spreading horror and petrifaction. Around the scattered priests grew the rudiments of a dark and secret cult, secret because the people of the new lands had other gods and devils, and thought only evil of elder and alien ones, and within that cult many hideous things were done. 
and many strange objects cherished. It was whispered that a certain line of elusive priests still harboured the true charm against Gatanathoa, which I Mashmo stole from the sleeping to Yog, though none remained who could read or understand the cryptic syllables, or who could even guess in what part of the world the lost Kana, the dreaded peak of Yadithgo, and the titan fortress of the devil-god, had lain. Though it flourished chiefly in those Pacific regions around which Mu itself had once stretched, there were rumours of the hidden and detested cult of Gatanathoa in ill-fated Atlantis, and on the abhorred plateau of Leng. Von Janst implied its presence in the fabled subterrene kingdom of Kanyan, and gave clear evidence that it had penetrated Egypt, Chaldea, Persia, China, the forgotten Semite empires of Africa, and Mexico and Peru in the New World. That it had a strong connection with the witchcraft movement in Europe, against which the bulls of popes were vainly directed, he more than strongly hinted. The West, however, was never favourable to its growth, and public indignation, aroused by glimpses of hideous rites and nameless sacrifices, wholly stamped out many of its branches. In the end it became a hunted, doubly furtive underground affair, yet never could its nucleus be quite exterminated. It always survived somehow, chiefly in the Far East and on the Pacific Islands, where its teachings became merged into the esoteric lore of the Polynesian Arioe. Von Janst gave subtle and disquieting hints of actual contact with the cult, so that as I read I shuddered at what was rumoured about his death. He spoke of the growth of certain ideas regarding the appearance of the devil-god, a creature which no human being, unless it were the too daring to Yog who had never returned, had ever seen, and contrasted this habit of speculation with the taboo prevailing in ancient Mu, against any attempt to imagine what the horror looked like. There was a peculiar fearfulness about the devotee's awed and fascinated whispers on this subject, whispers heavy with morbid curiosity, concerning the precise nature of what Tyog might have confronted in that frightful pre-human edifice on the dreaded and now sunken mountains, before the end, if it was an end, finally came and I felt oddly disturbed by the German scholar's oblique and insidious references to this topic. Scarcely less disturbing were von Janst's conjectures on the whereabouts of the stolen scroll of cantrips against Gatanathoa, and on the ultimate uses to which the scroll might be put. Despite all my assurance that the whole matter was purely mythical, I could not help shivering at the notion of a latter-day emergence of the monstrous god, and at the picture of a humanity turned suddenly to a race of abnormal statues, each encasing a living brain doomed to inert and helpless consciousness for untold eons of futurity. The old Dusseldorf savant had a poisonous way of suggesting more than he stated, and I could understand why his damnable book was suppressed in so many countries as blasphemous, dangerous, and unclean. I writhed with repulsion, yet the thing exerted an unholy fascination, and I could not lay it down till I had finished it. The alleged reproductions of designs and ideographs from Mu were marvellously and startlingly like the markings on the strange cylinder, and the characters on the scroll, and the whole account teemed with details having vague, irritating suggestions of resemblance to things connected with the hideous mummy. The cylinder and scroll, the Pacific setting, the persistent notion of old Captain Weatherby, that the Cyclopean crypt where the mummy was found had once lain under a vast building. Somehow, I was vaguely glad that the volcanic island had sunk before that massive suggestion of a trap-door could be opened. 4. What I read in the Black Book formed a fiendishly apt preparation for the news items and closer events which began to force themselves upon me in the spring of 1932. I can scarcely recall just when the increasingly frequent reports of police action against the odd and fantastical religious cults in the Orient and elsewhere commenced to impress me, but by May or June I realised that there was, all over the world, a surprising and unwanted burst of activity on the part of bizarre, 
furtive and esoteric mystical organizations, ordinarily quiescent and seldom heard of. It is not likely that I would have connected these reports with either the hints of von Janst or the popular furore over the mummy and cylinder in the museum, but for certain significant syllables and persistent resemblances, sensationally dwelt upon by the press, in the rites and speeches of the various secret celebrants brought to public attention. As it was, I could not help remarking with disquiet the frequent recurrence of a name in various corrupt forms, which seemed to constitute a focal point of all the cult worship, and which was obviously regarded with a singular mixture of reverence and terror. Some of the forms quoted were Gatanta, Tanotar, Thanthar, Gatan, and Katantar, and it did not require the suggestions of my now numerous occultist correspondents to make me see in these variants a hideous and suggestive kinship to the monstrous name rendered by von Janst as Gatanathoa. There were other disquieting features, too. Again and again, the report cited vague, awestruck references to a true scroll, something on which tremendous consequences seemed to hinge, and which was mentioned as being in the custody of a certain nagob, whoever and whatever he might be. Likewise, there was an insistent repetition of a name which sounded like Tog, Tiok, Yog, Zob, or Yob, and which my more and more excited consciousness involuntarily linked with the name of the hapless heretic to Yog, as given in the Black Book. This name was usually uttered in connection with such cryptical phrases as, It is none other than he. He had looked upon its face. He knows all, though he can neither see nor feel. He has brought the memory down through the eons. The true scroll will release him. Nagob has the true scroll. He can tell where to find it. Something very queer was undoubtedly in the air, and I did not wonder when my occultist correspondents, as well as the sensational Sunday papers, began to connect the new abnormal stirrings with the legends of Mu on the one hand, and with the frightful mummy's recent exploitation on the other hand. The widespread articles in the first wave of press publicity, with their insistent linkage of the mummy, cylinder, and scroll with the tale in the black book, and their crazily fantastic speculations about the whole matter, might very well have roused the latent fanaticism in hundreds of those furtive groups of exotic devotees with which our complex world abounds. Nor did the papers cease adding fuel to the flames, for the stories on the cult stirrings were even wilder than the earlier series of yarns. As the summer drew on, attendants noticed a curious new element among the throngs of visitors which, after a lull following the first burst of publicity, were again drawn to the museum by the second furore. More and more frequently, there were persons of strange and exotic aspect, swarthy Asiatics, long-haired nondescripts, and bearded brown men who seemed unused to European clothes, who would invariably inquire for the Hall of Mummies, and would subsequently be found staring at the hideous Pacific specimen in a veritable ecstasy of fascination. Some quiet, sinister undercurrent in this flood of eccentric foreigners seemed to impress all the guards, and I myself was far from undisturbed. I could not help thinking of the prevailing cult stirrings among just such exotics as these, and the connection of those stirrings with myths all too close to the frightful mummy and its cylinder scroll. At times I was half tempted to withdraw the mummy from exhibition especially when an attendant told me that he had several times glimpsed strangers making odd obeisances before it, and had overheard sing-song mutterings which sounded like chants or rituals addressed to it at hours when the visiting throngs were somewhat thinned. One of the guards acquired a queer nervous hallucination about the petrified horror in the lone glass case, alleging that he could see from day to day certain vague, subtle, and infinitely slight changes in the frantic flexion of the bony claws, and in the fear-crazed expression of the leathery face. He could not get rid of the loathsome idea that those horrible, bulging eyes were about to pop suddenly open. It was early in September, when the curious crowds had lessened and the Hall of Mummies was sometimes vacant, that the attempt to get at the mummy by cutting the glass of its case was made. The culprit, 
a swarthy Polynesian, was spied in time by a guard, and was overpowered before any damage occurred. Upon investigation, the fellow turned out to be a Hawaiian, notorious for his activity in certain underground religious cults, and having a considerable police record, in connection with abnormal and inhuman rites and sacrifices. Some of the papers found in his room were highly puzzling and disturbing, including many sheets covered with hieroglyphs closely resembling those on the scroll at the museum and in the black book of von Janst, but regarding these things he could not be prevailed upon to speak. Scarcely a week after this incident, another attempt to get at the mummy, this time by tampering with the lock of his case, resulted in a second arrest. The offender, a Singalese, had as long and unsavoury a record of loathsome cult activities as the Hawaiian had possessed, and displayed a kindred unwillingness to talk to the police. What made this case doubly and darkly interesting was that a guard had noticed this man several times before, and had heard him addressing to the mummy a peculiar chant containing unmistakable repetitions of the word to yog. As a result of this affair, I doubled the guards in the Hall of Mummies, and ordered them never to leave the now notorious specimen out of sight, even for a moment. As may well be imagined, the press made much of these two incidents, reviewing its talk of primal and fabulous moo, and claiming boldly that the hideous mummy was none other than the daring heretic Tayog, petrified by something he had seen in the pre-human citadel he had invaded, and preserved intact through one hundred and seventy-five thousand years of our planet's turbulent history. That the strange devotees represented cults descended from Mu, and that they were worshipping the mummy, or perhaps even seeking to awaken it to life by spells and incantations, was emphasized and reiterated in the most sensational fashion. Writers exploited the insistence of the old legends that the brain of Gatanatho as petrified victims remained conscious and unaffected, a point which served as a basis for the wildest and most improbable speculations. The mention of a true scroll also received due attention, it being the prevailing popular theory that Tiog's stolen charm against Gatanathoa was somewhere in existence, and that cult members were trying to bring it into contact with Tiog himself for some purpose of their own. One result of this exploitation was that a third wave of gaping visitors began flooding the museum, and staring at the hellish mummy which served as a nucleus for the whole strange and disturbing affair. It was among this wave of spectators, many of whom made repeated visits, that talk of the mummy's vaguely changing aspect first began to be widespread. I suppose, despite the disturbing notion of the nervous guard some months before, that the museum's personnel was too well used to the constant sight of odd shapes to pay close attention to details. In any case, it was the excited whispers of visitors which at length aroused the guards to the subtle mutation which was apparently in progress. Almost simultaneously the press got hold of it, with blatant results which can well be imagined. Naturally, I gave the matter my most careful observation, and by the middle of October decided that a definite disintegration of the mummy was under way. Through some chemical or physical influence in the air, the half-stony, half-leathery fibres seemed to be gradually relaxing, causing distinct variations in the angles of the limbs, and in certain details of the fear-twisted facial expression. After a half-century of perfect preservation, this was a highly disconcerting development, and I had the museum's taxidermist, Dr. Moore, go carefully over the gruesome object several times. He reported a general relaxation and softening, and gave the thing two or three astringent sprayings, but did not dare to attempt anything drastic, lest there be a sudden crumbling and accelerated decay. The effect of all this upon the gaping crowds was curious. Heretofore, each new sensation sprung by the press had brought fresh waves of staring and whispering visitors. But now, though the papers blathered endlessly about the mummy's changes, the public seemed to have acquired a definite sense of fear, which outranked even its morbid curiosity. People seemed to feel that a sinister aura hovered over the museum and from a high peak the attendants fell to a level distinctly below normal. This lessened attendance gave added prominence to the stream of freakish foreigners, 
who continued to infest the place, and whose numbers seemed in no way diminished. On November 18th, a Peruvian of Indian blood suffered a strange hysterical or epileptic seizure in front of the mummy. Afterwards, shrieking from his hospital cot, it tried to open its eyes. Tiog tried to open his eyes and stare at me. I was by this time on the point of removing the object from exhibition, but permitted myself to be overruled at a meeting of our very conservative directors. However, I could see that the museum was beginning to acquire an unholy reputation in its austere and quiet neighbourhood. After this incident, I gave instructions that no one be allowed to pause before the monstrous Pacific relic for more than a few minutes at a time. It was on November 24th, after the museum's five o'clock closing, that one of the guards noticed a minute opening of the mummy's eyes. The phenomenon was very slight, nothing but a thin crescent of cornea being visible in either eye, but it was none the less of the highest interest. Dr. Moore, having been summoned hastily, was about to study the exposed bits of eyeball with a magnifier, when his handling of the mummy caused the leathery lids to fall tightly shut again. All gentle efforts to open them failed, and the taxidermist did not dare to apply drastic measures. When he notified me of all this by telephone, I felt a sense of mounting dread hard to reconcile with the apparently simple event concerned. For a moment, I could share the popular impression that some evil, amorphous blight from unplumbed deeps of time and space hung murkily and menacingly over the museum. Two nights later, a sullen Filipino was trying to secrete himself in the museum at closing time. Arrested and taken to the station, he refused even to give his name, and was detained as a suspicious person. Meanwhile, the strict surveillance of the mummy seemed to discourage the odd hordes of foreigners from haunting it. At least, the number of exotic visitors distinctly fell off, after the enforcement of the move-along order. It was during the early morning hours of Thursday, December 1st, that a terrible climax developed. At about one o'clock, horrible screams of mortal fright and agony were heard issuing from the museum, and a series of frantic telephone calls from neighbours brought to the scene quickly and simultaneously a squad of police and several museum officials, including myself. Some of the policemen surrounded the building, while others, with the officials, cautiously entered. In the main corridor, we found the night watchman strangled to death, a bit of East Indian hemp still knotted around his neck, and realised that despite all precautions, some darkly evil intruder or intruders had gained access to the place. Now, however, a tomb-like silence enfolded everything, and we almost feared to advance upstairs to the fateful wing, where we knew the core of the trouble must lurk. We felt a bit more steadied after flooding the building with light from the central switches in the corridor, and finally crept reluctantly up the curving staircase and through a lofty archway to the Hall of Mummies. 5. It is from this point onward that reports of the hideous case have been censored, for we have all agreed that no good can be accomplished by a public knowledge of those terrestrial conditions implied by the further developments. I have said that we flooded the whole building with light before our ascent. Now, beneath the beams that beat down on the glistening cases and their gruesome contents, we saw outspread a mute horror, whose baffling details testified to happenings utterly beyond our comprehension. There were two intruders, who we afterward agreed must have hidden in the building before closing time, but they would never be executed for the watchman's murder they had already paid the penalty. One was a Burmese, and the other a Fiji Islander, both known to the police for their share in frightful and repulsive cult activities. They were dead, and the more we examined them, the more utterly monstrous and unnameable we felt their manner of death to be. On both faces was a more wholly frantic and inhuman look of fright than even the oldest policeman had ever seen before. Yet in the state of the two bodies there were vast and significant differences. The Burmese lay collapsed close to the nameless mummy's case, from which a square of glass had been neatly cut. In his right hand was a scroll of bluish membrane, which I at once saw was covered with greyish hieroglyphs, 
almost a duplicate of the scroll in the strange cylinder in the library downstairs, though later study brought out subtle differences. There was no mark of violence on the body, and in view of the desperate, agonized expression on the twisted face, we could only conclude that the man died of sheer fright. It was the closely adjacent Fijian, though, that gave us the profoundest shock. One of the policemen was the first to feel of him, and the cry of fright he emitted added another shudder to that neighborhood's night of terror. We ought to have known, from the lethal grayness of the once black, fear-twisted face, and of the bony hands, one of which still clutched an electric torch, that something was hideously wrong. Yet every one of us was unprepared for what that officer's hesitant touch disclosed. Even now I can think of it only with a paroxysm of dread and repulsion. To be brief, the hapless invader, who less than an hour before had been a sturdy, living Melanesian bent on unknown evils, was now a rigid, ash-grey figure of stony, leathery petrifaction, in every respect identical with the crouching eon-old blasphemy in the violated glass case. Yet that was not the worst crowning all other horrors, and indeed seizing our shocked attention before we turned to the bodies on the floor, was the state of the frightful mummy. No longer could its changes be called vague and subtle, for it had now made radical shifts of posture. It had sagged and slumped with a curious loss of rigidity. Its bony claws had sunk until they no longer even partly covered its leathery, fear-crazed face, and, God help us, its Hellish bulging eyes had popped wide open, and seemed to be staring directly at the two intruders who had died of fright, or worse. That ghastly, dead fish stare was hideously mesmerizing, and it haunted us all the time we were examining the bodies of the invaders. Its effect on our nerves was damnably queer, for we somehow felt a curious rigidity creeping over us, and hampering our simplest motions a rigidity which later vanished very oddly when we passed the hieroglyph scroll around for inspection. Every now and then I felt my gaze drawn irresistibly toward those horrible bulging eyes in the case, and when I returned to study them after viewing the bodies, I thought I detected something very singular about the glassy surface of the dark and marvellously well-preserved pupils. The more I looked, the more fascinated I became— and at last I went down to the office, despite that strange stiffness in my limbs, and brought up a strong, multiple magnifying glass. With this, I commenced a very close and careful survey of the fishy pupils, while the others crowded expectantly around. I had always been rather sceptical of the theory that scenes and objects become photographed on the retina of the eye in cases of death or coma— Yet no sooner did I look through the lens than I realized the presence of some sort of image other than the room's reflection in the glassy, bulging optics of this nameless spawn of the eons. Certainly, there was a dimly outlined scene on the age-old retinal surface, and I could not doubt that it formed the last thing on which those eyes had looked in life countless millennia ago. It seemed to be steadily fading— and I fumbled with the magnifier in order to shift another lens into place. Yet it must have been accurate and clear-cut, even if infinitesimally small, when, in response to some evil spell or act connected with their visit, it had confronted those intruders, who were frightened to death. With the extra lens I could make out many details formerly invisible, and the awed group around me hung on the flood of words with which I tried to tell what I saw. For here— in the year 1932, a man in the city of Boston was looking on something which belonged to an unknown and utterly alien world, a world that vanished from existence and normal memory eons ago. There was a vast room, a chamber of cyclopean masonry, and I seemed to be viewing it from one of its corners. On the walls were carvings so hideous that even in this imperfect image their stark blasphemousness and bestiality sickened me. I could not believe that the carvers of these things were human, or that they had ever seen human beings when they shaped the frightful outlines which leered at the beholder. 
In the centre of the chamber was a colossal trap-door of stone, pushed upward to permit the emergence of some object from below. The object should have been clearly visible, indeed must have been when the eyes first opened before the fear-stricken intruders, though under my lenses it was merely a monstrous blur. As it happened, I was studying the right eye only, when I brought the extra magnification into play. A moment later, I wished fervently that my search had ended there. As it was, however, the zeal of discovery and revelation was upon me, and I shifted my powerful lenses to the mummy's left eye, in the hope of finding the image less faded on that retina. My hands, trembling with excitement and unnaturally stiff from some obscure influence, were slow in bringing the magnifier into focus, but a moment later I realized that the image was less faded than in the other eye. I saw in a morbid flash of half-distinctness the insufferable thing which was welling up through the prodigious trapdoor in that cyclopean, immemorially archaic crypt of a lost world, and fell fainting with an inarticulate shriek, of which I am not even ashamed. By the time I revived, there was no distinct image of anything in either eye of the monstrous mummy. Sergeant Keefe of the police looked with my glass, for I could not bring myself to face that abnormal entity again, and I thanked all the powers of the cosmos that I had not looked earlier than I did. It took all my resolution, and a great deal of solicitation, to make me relate what I had glimpsed in the hideous moment of revelation. Indeed, I could not speak till we had all adjourned to the office below, out of sight of that demoniac thing which could not be, for I began to harbour the most terrible and fantastic notions about the mummy, and its glassy, bulging eyes, that it had a kind of hellish consciousness, seeing all that occurred before it, and trying vainly to communicate some frightful message from the gulfs of time. That meant madness, but at last I thought I might be better off, if I told what I had half seen. After all, it was not a long thing to tell. Oozing and surging up out of that yawning trapdoor in the Cyclopean crypt, I had glimpsed such an unbelievable behemothic monstrosity, that I could not doubt the power of its original to kill with its mere sight. Even now I cannot begin to suggest it with any words at my command. I might call it gigantic, tentacled, proboscidean, octopus-eyed, semi-amorphous, plastic, partly squamous and partly rugous. Ah! But nothing I could say could even adumbrate the loathsome, unholy, non-human, extra-galactic horror and hatefulness and unutterable evil of that forbidden spawn of black chaos and illimitable night. As I write these words, the associated mental image causes me to lean back faint and nauseated. As I told of the sight to the men around me in the office, I had to fight to preserve the consciousness I had regained. Nor were my hearers much less moved. Not a man spoke above a whisper, for a full quarter hour, and there were awed, half furtive references to the frightful lure and the black book, to the recent newspaper tales of cult stirrings, and to the sinister events in the museum. Gatanathoa, even its smallest perfect image, could petrify. To Yog, the false scroll, he never came back. The true scroll which could fully or partly undo the petrification. Did it survive? The hellish cults, the phrases overheard. It is none other than he. He had looked upon its face. He knows all though he can neither see nor feel. He had brought the memory down through the eons. The true scroll will release him. Nagob has the true scroll. He can tell where to find it. Only the healing greyness of the dawn brought us back to sanity. A sanity which made of that glimpse of mine a closed topic, something not to be explained or thought of again. We gave out only partial reports to the press, and later on, co-operated with the papers in making other suppressions. For example, when the autopsy showed the brain and several other internal organs of the petrified Fijian to be fresh and unpetrified, though hermetically sealed by the petrifaction of the exterior flesh, an anomaly about which physicians are still guardedly and bewilderedly debating, we did not wish a furore to be started. 
We knew too well what the yellow journals, remembering what was said of the intact, brained, and still conscious state of Gatanatho Estoni, leathery victims, would make of this detail. As matters stood, they pointed out that the man who had held the hieroglyph scroll, and who had evidently thrust it at the mummy through the opening in the case, was not petrified, while the man who had not held it was, and they demanded that we make certain experiments applying the scroll both to the stony, leathery body of the Fijian and to the mummy itself, we indignantly refused to abet such superstitious notions. Of course, the mummy was withdrawn from public view, and transferred to the museum laboratory, awaiting a really scientific examination, before some suitable medical authority. Remembering past events, we kept it under a strict guard, but even so, an attempt was made to enter the museum at 2.25 a.m. on December the 5th. Prompt working of the burglar alarm frustrated the design, though unfortunately the criminal or criminals escaped. That no hint of anything further ever reached the public, I am profoundly thankful. I wish devoutly that there were nothing more to tell. There will, of course, be leaks and if anything happens to me, I do not know what my executors will do with this manuscript, but at least the case will not be painfully fresh in the multitude's memory when the revelation comes. Besides, no one will believe the facts when they are finally told. That is the curious thing about the multitude. When their yellow press makes hence, they are ready to swallow anything, but when a stupendous and abnormal revelation is actually made, they laugh it aside as a lie. For the sake of general sanity, it is probably better so. I have said that a scientific examination of the frightful mummy was planned. This took place on December 8th, exactly a week after the hideous culmination of events, and was conducted by the eminent Dr. William Minnow, in conjunction with Wentworth Moore, Doctor of Science, taxidermist of the museum. Dr. Minnow had witnessed the autopsy of the oddly petrified Fijian the week before, there were also present Messrs. Lawrence Cabot and Dudley Saltonstall of the Museum's trustees, Doctors Mason, Wells, and Carver of the Museum staff, two representatives of the press, and myself. During the week, the condition of the hideous specimen had not visibly changed, though some relaxation of its fibres caused the position of the glassy, open eyes to shift slightly from time to time. All of the staff dreaded to look at the thing, for its suggestion of quiet, Conscious watching had become intolerable, and it was only with an effort that I could bring myself to attend the examination. Dr. Minnow arrived shortly after 1 p.m., and within a few minutes began his survey of the mummy. Considerable disintegration took place under his hands, and in view of this, and of what we told him concerning the gradual relaxation of the specimen since the 1st of October, he decided that a thorough dissection ought to be made before the substance was further impaired. The proper instruments being present in the laboratory equipment, he began at once, exclaiming aloud at the odd, fibrous nature of the grey, mummified substance. But his exclamation was still louder when he made the first deep incision, for out of that cut there slowly trickled a thick crimson stream, whose nature, despite the infinite ages dividing this hellish mummy's lifetime from the present, was utterly unmistakable. A few more deft strokes revealed various organs, in astonishing degrees of non-petrified preservation, all indeed being intact, except where injuries to the petrified exterior had brought about malformation or destruction. The resemblance of this condition to that found in the fright-killed Fiji Islander was so strong that the eminent physician gasped in bewilderment. The perfection of those ghastly, bulging eyes was uncanny, and their exact state with respect to petrifaction was very difficult to determine. At 3.30 p.m., the brain case was opened, and ten minutes later, our stunned group took an oath of secrecy, which only such guarded documents as this manuscript will ever modify. Even the two reporters were glad to confirm the silence for the opening had revealed a pulsing, living brain.